it, it immediately felt like, wow, this is happening. I can't believe it. But it felt like my victory that I worked hard for and it felt real immediately. But it also still to this day feels odd. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, whose favorite meal to cook for others is salmon and spinach risotto, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 38 of the Running For Real podcast. Last week, we spoke to David Karen of Run Angel, who told us about his safety product, which is making huge differences in the running world and really makes people feel safe. He talked about how the uh, manager of U2, yes, the band U2, um, decided to invest in this product just because he believed this was really making a difference. And I can totally see that. I also gave you over 25 running gift ideas you could add to your Christmas list or get for your friends and family this holiday season. And so hopefully if you missed that one, you can go back and check it out. Now, today I have a guest who also does not do many interviews anymore. Um, As with many of our guests lately, we're getting kind of some exclusive uh, interviews here, but we get a look into the life of Emma Coburn, who was the first American woman to ever win gold in the steeplechase in either the Olympics or the World Championships. She also got a bronze medal in the 2016 Rio Olympics. Emma is just a great example of putting in the work and steadily rising up. There's no secrets here. She just has done the work and it's kind of showing through now. Now, I just want to say Emma had a really bad cough the day we recorded. So you may hear her coughing from time to time. But it just goes to show you that she's human, right? Everyone gets sick sometimes. So after we hear a few words from you, Can and Body Health, we will be right to the interview. Thank you to Generation UCAM for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. I have loved this company for many years and it is wonderful that they support me and you by helping me to bring the best guests like this one today with Emma Coburn. So thank you so much UCAM for all that you do for me and all that you do for runners everywhere. December already. <laughs> I can barely believe it either. Although I actually love this time of year. Everyone's in a good mood and things are really cheery. Our friends at Body Health are feeling especially good and later in the show I'll tell you how you can be one of two winners of a six pack of Perfect Amino. You can tune in later to hear more. Emma, thank you so much for being here on the Running For Real podcast today. I am really excited for this interview. You are someone I've been wanting to speak to for a while and I'm glad that I finally have been able to get you on the show. So thanks so much for your time. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having the patience. Um, I had a little bit of a crazy fall, so I was happy to finally get a chance to talk. Yeah. Well, you kind of deserved it with uh, all that you've done. And, you know, that's just the small matter of getting married just may may have thrown a, a blip in things with uh, a <laughs> but well worth it. We'll get into that uh, in a minute. But before we kind of go into the, the I don't want to say the glamorous side, but the kind of successful side, let's talk about like the very beginning. Now, as uh, an elite myself, I kind of understand that it's not necessarily what people think where, um, you know, you just, uh, you're five years old and you're beating everyone else. And, um, you know, you can always, you enjoy it from the very beginning. I hated running when I first started, but maybe tell us, was yours a situation of love at first sight with running or was it something you kind of found out you were good at and then started to enjoy it from there? Yeah, more of the latter. I really didn't, see myself as a runner until I started getting recruited, um, to go to college. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a small mountain town in Colorado called Crested Butte. And every kid there grows up skiing and snowboarding and climbing mountains and grows up very, um, athletic or just with adventurous hobbies. Mm -hmm. And so I was just like all the rest of my peers. And when I started in middle school, my older siblings, um, ran track. And so I did it as well. I also did volleyball, basketball, ice hockey. Um, (laughs) and so that was just another thing to add to it. And I, it wasn't my main focus. I never 
trained in the summer or the winter. I only ran during cross country and track seasons. And even then, even by my senior year, I was running maybe 15 to 20 miles a week total. And honestly, just from like for April and May, and that was it. So I grew up athletic, but I didn't necessarily stand out as an elite athlete until, you know, in high school, I was good at team sports and was the captain of my teams and stuff. But, um, I didn't really see myself as a runner until I started getting recruited to do it in college. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't enjoy running until I started dating Joe, my senior year. And we met our junior year and he was a runner and he thought running was senior year of college or high school, high school, Okay, high school. Um, so yeah, he, thought running was cool and he was good at it. And he also did basketball. So we were on the same team and, um, or like, you know, we traveled to games together and he thought running was cool and he tried really hard and I thought Joe was cool. So I started trying a little (laughs) bit harder and running and then was able to, you know, go to college for it. And in college, obviously saw myself as a runner and Mm -hmm. an elite runner, but it wasn't really until I got to college that the reality of you know, being a professional runner came into my life. Um, I made the world team in 2011 in the steeplechase. And that's when it clicked that, Oh, I'm not just good in college. I'm good for the whole U S. Um, and this could be my job when I graduate. So it was a very, uh, slow process for me and it wasn't always, um, running wasn't always my number one thing. And it, it, really wasn't what defined me growing up. Was it, do you think, you know, having all those other sports, especially like you said, the more adventurous ones, did it seem like then running was a bit too simple? Like it's just running, like how can people, you know, enjoy this and make it into a career and things like that? Because, you know, it just seems so simple when you compare it to all those other sports. I think what was challenging with running is that it's really difficult. It hurts yes. almost every day. and it's a very much, very much an individual sport while you are, you know, certainly in some scenarios on relay teams or scored as a team in cross country, it is your performance is just based on you. And so what I loved about team sports was that there were five people on the ice and hockey. There were five people on Mm -hmm. the court in basketball, six people on the court in volleyball who had to carry this weight as a team. And so I think what took me a while to really love running was getting over the fear of the individual side of it and learning to cope with that stress and those pressures of, of having your performance completely rely, you know, solely on you. But the growing up doing a lot of sports and, and not just team sports, but again, all of my peers growing up skiing and snowboarding and climbing mountains and kayaking and you know, all the stuff we did growing up in a small mountain town, those things really made me click with the steeplechase. Mm, I thought the water jump was super fun. The very (laughs) first time I tried it, I nearly cleared it. And it was like, Oh, this is great. I, I wish I was doing this years ago. You know, like it just, it just clicked right away. And I think part of that love and feeling of comfort that I have in the steeplechase is truly rooted in my experiences growing up Absolutely. with, with kind of more adventurous activities and hobbies. Yeah, yeah, I could definitely see that. And then even when you mentioned about the team aspect, I mean, you, I don't know, cause I didn't go there, but it seems to me like university of Colorado is more a school that is all about that. Like it seems, you know, you guys, especially those of you as alumni, you very, like all the buffs are kind of very tied together, very close, even people like, you know, Jenny Simpson's Kyra Goucher, who you didn't necessarily uh, you went there at the same time, but it seems like that team atmosphere is, you know, a huge part of being there. So do you think that was a big part of you choosing, uh, university of Colorado? I really chose university of Colorado because one, the the program there is, is the best program in the country historically, you know, Mm -hmm. consistently, obviously there's been up years and down years. And my freshman year was a down year. We didn't even qualify for cross country nationals, but consistently, if you look at any program in the country for a whole men's and women's program together, it's the best. And so I grew up in Colorado. My parents went to university of Colorado. My 
older siblings went to University of Colorado, oh, okay. my aunts and uncles and grandparents. <laughs> so I was actually born in Boulder and then we moved up to Crested Butte when I was seven. And so I was a buff fan, like from day one. And had I not discovered that I was good at running, I would have gone to University of Colorado as a normal student. Mm, okay. Um, so it kind of just lucked out that they happened to also have the best running program in the country. And, you know, going to answer your, or to go on your observation of, uh, of it being a real team atmosphere, the, the culture at Colorado is really unique. And every athlete on that team treats their running career. Like it's their job. You know, they eat right. They go to bed early. They show up on big, big races and perform Mm -hmm. big and work really hard. And so the culture is very professional Mm -hmm. and there is this camaraderie around the incredible work ethic, work ethic that an athlete has to have to Mm -hmm. be able to succeed at the university of Colorado. And so that's, it's something that bonds us, you know, in the years after college as well. And it's, it's not something that in the moment I realized was unique to Colorado. I thought that's how everyone trained and how everyone's attitude was. But I think it's rare to have, you know, 50 young boys and girls, 18, 19, 20 year olds who have that strong of a work ethic and that consistent of a, of a um, professional attitude towards the work that they do at practice. So it's, the culture really is special and it does create this team dynamic and this team atmosphere that, that again, ties a thread to everyone, the the current athletes now and the people who graduated 15 years ago, Mm -hmm. you know, we're all very supportive of one another. And, uh, I think can share that common bond. Yeah, it definitely seems like it's unique and, and even, you know, more than just being great for team and kind of supporting one another, but the amount of professional athletes that, um, Colorado pumps out is far more than any other school who might have, you know, a few here and there, you know, obviously Oregon being similar uh, to that, but, um, seems like, you know, there's just all these big names, you know, the two I've mentioned, Shayla Kipp, Laura Thwaite, um, there's so many people I can name that, um, come from Colorado and, and any ideas on what it is that makes that culture? Is it kind of a, almost like a legendary thing? Like you expected now, like you come here to have that atmosphere. If you don't want that atmosphere, don't come here. Or is it, is it Mark Wetmore himself? Like, what is it you think that brings that kind of culture there? Um, obviously Mark and Heather are the foundation of why the culture is what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do think though, there is a, it's like a snowball effect. If you see the successes of people before you and you just want to build on it. And then when you're gone, the people want to build on your success and it just builds and builds. And there is such a high standard of excellence that not only Mark and Heather provide, but that again, the past athletes have, Mm -hmm. have reinforced And, um, yeah, that's just, it's a gritty program. You have to be tough to succeed in it and you have to be really disciplined and dedicated. And I think one really nice thing of having successful athletes continue on is that when you are an athlete there yourself, you see your, um, career as limitless. I came in as a freshman and Jenny was a senior and we overlapped for one year. And that season, it was the spring of 2009, winter, spring of 2009, when she broke, you know, several indoor records, several outdoor records. She ran 359. Um, later that summer she won, uh, she finished fifth in Berlin in the steeplechase at worlds. So just being Jenny's roommate at track meets when she's breaking all these records really, you know, opened my eyes to think, Oh, if, you know, she's just a normal person who works every day really hard, I can do that too. And it kind of, it makes all of these big goals and dreams seem more attainable yeah, when yeah. you see, when you see someone who might be a teammate or a former teammate or someone who, you know, went through the same program, achieve those things. Yeah. And that's actually one of my goals with this whole podcast is to show people listening that someone like you is not necessarily this superhuman who, um, you know, everything is just been kind of privileged for you your whole life even as you mentioned running is hard every day so hearing that right now like it's trying to show people that you know it can be done and hopefully that's what comes across in these podcast interviews but speaking of that so I want to get on to the part that I know most people are the most interested in which is um 
you know, this year and your performance this year, but it's not like you kind of appeared out of nowhere. You had been steadily progressing year after year, kind of getting closer, getting faster, really um, doing well at the steeplechase. But this year, you know, you were the first American woman to win gold in the steeplechase at either the World Championships or the Olympics. So just before we get into the race itself, when you were on that starting line or in the days leading up, did you have any idea that you could realistically win? Is it one of those things, you know, we all like to hope that we could win, but did you realistically think, you know, had you told yourself a week before that you had a real shot here or was it kind of, um, we'll see what happens. I'm not even going to allow myself to think about that. I did not think I would win. I did not think I could win. I came and ranked sixth and consistently in diamond leagues had finished fourth or fifth. Um, and just on the descending order list, I think I was sixth and I obviously workouts had been going well. I was the fittest I'd ever been, but we spent a lot of time, a lot of time training up in Crested Butte. And so I was doing great workouts up there, but I had never really spent a big chunk of time training up there since, Mm -hmm. since high school. So I was hoping it would translate and then I was, you know, I thought I was in nine minute shape, but I thought that you never actually run to your fitness. You know, you, you have to be in that kind of shape and then the race plays out and you hope to finish within five seconds of that or whatever. So Especially I thought realistically, race, yeah. yeah. So I thought, yeah, exactly. A race like world championships when anything can happen. So I realistically thought I would run five Oh, sorry, nine Oh five <laughs> and finish third, fourth, or fifth. And I thought if I was really smart and raced perfectly and really tough, I could, I could finish third. (laughs) But in Rio, I came into that ranked third, expected to, to finish third or fourth. And so finishing in third in Rio was more of a relief of Mm -hmm. like, okay, I did what I was, I came in ranked third. I finished third and I was close. I was close to second, but I met the expectation. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was a, you know, an incredible experience, obviously, and so special, but it was definitely the expectation that I should be that, that that's where I belonged. And London was much more of a surprise. And Joe just kept telling me, you know, before the race, just stay with it for 2k, no matter what, and see what happens. And consistently, in all the diamond leagues, I've, I had the fastest last kilometer split, even though I'd finish in fourth or fifth, my, my comfort is to slowly wind it up. Mm-hmm. And a lot of my opponents, a lot of the Kenyan women really like to make that second K their fastest K and is actually faster than their kick, you know, their closing kicking mm-hmm. kilometer. Um, and so I had to challenge myself to get out of my comfort zone and just go with them. Mm-hmm. And so Joe said, just go with them. It's going to hurt, but the hurt is going to be worth it. And then he also said, and have a really good last water jump. And in both 2015 and 2016, I kind of started my kick with 300 to go and spent way too much energy. Mm-hmm. So then by the time I got to the water jump, I crumbled it a little bit when I fell, when I landed, I just didn't Mm -hmm. come off with power. And so in both those scenarios, I was near people and the people I was with beat me. Mm -hmm. And so the exact same story was playing out in London. And I just had to, uh, you know, as I said, stay really tough and be with them at 2k. But then, um, with 300 to go, there were moves and surges and I just stayed patient and remembered what Joe said and it worked out. So yeah. that was, so, it was definitely more of a surprise than, than any yeah. race I've ever been in. Yeah. 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 So there's, there's a few things I want to ask you about that. Um, one being, so were you feeling strong even at that 2k or were you kind of just saying, hold on, hold on, hold on. There were a few moments where, you know, probably about a mile in that we started stringing out a little bit and I was feeling, I had to actually pay attention to how my body felt because it just, we were going fast Mm -hmm. and I felt that we were going fast, but I was actually feeling pretty relaxed. You know, like I could tell my turnover, we were going fast, but I actually just had to 
analyze how I was feeling. And I was like, Oh, I actually feel good. So yes, continue to go with them, close whatever gap, you know, they only had a, maybe a meter on me or two, but I had to kind of do a little bit of, uh, analysis on how I was feeling at that Mm -hmm. point. Because again, typically that's when I'm, I let off the gas a little bit and gear up for a hard last K. And so it was just a different, you know, mental shift to stay Mm -hmm. on it. But it was, it, I, I think Courtney and I both have a similar experience that we just both felt so good. And I don't know if it's the adrenaline or perfect weather or perfect pacing or what it was, but both of us felt very strong. I have, I've had many steeplechase races where the last 600, I'm counting down every Mm -hmm hundred, just waiting for that finish line. And this one, I just felt like, um, very in control of my body and felt like very present. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Run as high. (laughs) Okay. So then when, uh, you know, there's something else I want to ask you about with that water jump you mentioned, but, um, when, uh, Jep Kamoy, I think that's how you say it, um, went the wrong way. What went through your mind when that happened? crazy things happen in championship races mm-hmm. and crazy things always happen in a steeplechase, no matter what the race. So I think we're steeplechasers are a little bit better conditioned to cope with something strange happening Okay, because there's often a fall. There's often, um, carnage on a water jump. There's often just things you cannot predict going in. And so that was something that, you know, back in my college days and and training under Mark and Heather that they were good at instilling in all of us of saying like weird things are going to happen and just focus on your own race. And Joe has always done, even before he was my coach has always done a really good job of instilling confidence in me of, Mm. of saying that, you know, like it doesn't matter what they do. You just go and do what you do and focus on you. And So when she took the wrong way, I just thought, huh, that's weird, but it didn't bother me. It didn't distract me or anything. Mm -hmm. And so you don't feel like you feel like everyone's kind of was in that same mindset of it didn't kind of change the the tone of the race by that happening. I don't think from, I don't think Courtney and I at least felt that way. I'm not sure if the Kenyan runners felt that way. Mm -hmm. I don't know what their tactics were going in. If they had, you know, a, a group tactic that they wanted to execute a certain plan and her messing up ruined it, or if it didn't affect anyone else. But I know from my perspective and I think Corny's perspective, it didn't, it didn't throw us off. But again, the potentially the Kenyan women may have been a little startled to see their teammate, you know, mess up like that. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. And then just one more thing with that water jump, just going back to that for a minute, that final water jump, looking back now, do you think the way it was kind of playing out um, had you gone maybe a little bit before that water jump, do you think that adrenaline would have been able to pull you on in that final bit? Or do you think, still think looking back, you a hundred percent made the right choice to make the move when you did. And like, it wouldn't have happened that way. Had you not moved when you did. I think I made the right decision to make that move. But again, I was feeling really strong the last hundred and waiting for someone to come up yeah. and pass me. And no one did. Like, I just felt really powerful. So I think I had enough in the tank still to where had I gone with 300 to go, it may have turned out the same way. Mm -hmm. Um, But it may have been a closer battle or I may have been dying more. You know, it's hard to say, but I don't, I'm really happy with how it went. (laughs) Yeah, no, no, as you should be. It was, uh, you know, dream come true. And was there any point going down that straight away where you thought, I have this? like this is mine or were you not even allowing yourself to entertain the idea until you crossed the line? Uh, it was a a strange experience because I so rarely find myself in a tight race where I come out kicking as the winner. Mm -hmm. Um, often I'm either winning by a hundred meters or something or 50 meters. And it's not a, it's not as much of a sprint for the line. Mm -hmm. Um, or I'm losing by in the diamond leagues or something, I'm losing by 50 meters and I'm not, and I'm by myself. So I'm often in no man's land alone in a lot of races, except for Rio and Beijing when I came out the loser on this, on, uh, <laughs> you know, on the kicking. So, um, I was really just, I'm so not used to that 
feeling of feeling good with a hundred meters to go and kicking and feeling strong. So I was again, waiting for someone to come up and challenge me. But then I also kind of was like zoning out. I went over the barrier and then I saw someone's hip number had come off and it was like in lane two. And I was like, I wonder who that belongs to and just (laughs) running. And then, then with, you know, maybe four seconds to go in the race, three seconds to go in the race. I like clicked back into what was happening and realized that I was going to win because I could see, you know, the jumbotron and just started smiling and then finished. And immediately, you know, my instinct was to turn around and celebrate with Courtney and seeing her have such, such a successful race was incredible too. So, um, it was a surreal moment and, um, I didn't, again, up until a few seconds to go, I didn't think I was yeah. winning. Yeah. Well, I think it's kind of dangerous to think that way. I mean, there's so many situations where someone has kind of thought about it and, and kind of given up too early and then lost it in the end. So I think that's obviously the best way to be, but so like you said, you turned around, you grabbed Courtney, you both kind of fell to the ground. Um, and just curious, what were you saying to each other in that moment? Was it just a, a, you know, a big thing of, Oh my God, Oh my God. Or what, <laughs> like what was going through the words coming out of your mouth at that point? <laughs> Courtney, Courtney was, was funny. She just kept saying, is this real? Is this real? <laughs> And I kept saying, yes. And then I just kept saying, holy moly. (laughs) Um, And well, not moly, but you know, and (laughs) we all saw Shalane last weekend. So yes. (laughs) And um, just could not believe it. And I just kept going, what? Like what? (laughs) And then I saw Joe and both of us just went to each other before we hugged or kissed and just were like, what? Like we could not believe it. And so it was really, um, it was really special having Courtney by my side, you know, two American flags Mm. running through the stadium together was really special. Um, and we just couldn't believe it. We were speechless. And then of course you get the buzzkill of going into drug testing, (laughs) but you know, after that it was dinner and drinks with my parents who were there and Joe and just really trying to soak it all in and recapping every second of the race. And, um, yeah, it was, it was really special. And how long do you think it took you before it actually like sunk in? Like, wow, I'm a world champion. Um, that's a tough one to answer because it, it immediately yeah. felt, it, it immediately felt like, wow, this is happening. This happened. I can't believe it. But like, it, it felt like my victory that I worked hard for and it felt yeah. real immediately. But it also still to this day feels odd. Sometimes if someone, you know, if I'm being introduced as at an event as world champion, I still like get a little smile. And (laughs) um, yeah, so it it feels again, like the very first second I crossed the line, it felt incredible and it felt like a hard earned victory, but um, that I was incredibly proud of, but it still feels a little um, it still feels very special Mm -hmm. to the, you know, to this day and, and, um, a little bit still of that dream come true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and no one can ever take that away from you, which is the really cool thing. And then how did you feel about the way that the the media just buzzed after this? Like it (laughs) felt like so much more than a win for you and Courtney, but like a win for America. And that, that it just (laughs) seemed like the whole world was like looking at this one race of yours. Like, how did that feel knowing that it wasn't just you winning. It was, you know, this whole big thing around it. Well, I think what was really special about both 2016 and 2017 is that just team USA delivered in 2015. We had a really low medal count as a team. I was projected, I think to win a bronze and I didn't, and I did poorly. Um, and so just being a part of a group and part of a team that really delivered two years in a row and the sprinters almost always deliver, but the distance runners have really gained this momentum and to win so many medals on the distance side feels, it just feels incredible. And it's less even about me and Courtney, but it's, you know, I watched Jenny win her medal and, um, was freaking out. And I watched Amy win her medal and was sweating and crying and freaking out. And, and when you watch those performances, you really believe that it's possible for you too. And it goes back to what we were talking about with 
being in college and witnessing your older peers have such success, it makes it feel like you can have that moment too. And so it was, you know, it's fun that Courtney and I got to experience that, all of that together and that, that the world did care about our race, but it overall, it was more of a feeling that, you know, we did it as team USA distance runners and not just me and Courtney, but as a whole group, we really performed well. And I think our overall confidence as a group is now higher. And we feel like if we get on a starting line, we deserve a shot to win. And I think, or a shot to medal. And I think that attitude is different, at least from when I was on the 2011, 2012 teams and even the 2015 team, it didn't, that kind of group culture on the distance side wasn't as dominant that like, Oh, this is ours. We're going to win these medals. And so it's been really fun to be a part of it the last two years. Yeah, no, so cool. Although I do find it funny that you said your medal count was really low in 2015 when Britain, you know, we <laughs> we struggled to get like a quarter of the medals that USA <laughs> does. So it's always funny me hearing you say that because whenever we look at the medal table, it's like, oh, you know, USA got their usual hundreds. So funny hearing you say that. But no, I can definitely <laughs> see the difference. And especially like you said, in the distance side of things, there's been a huge difference. Um, all right. So I want to talk about something a little bit different, um, with you, which is that, you know, you have this huge social media following people have like really taken to you. They just love following what you're doing, you know, but I think one of the main reasons people love following you is not obviously because you're fast and you're pretty and, and all the other things that come along with it, but it's also that you show a very real side of yourself, which people really appreciate. You're not hiding who you are. You're not showing everything is perfect all the time. Why do you see that as something that is important to you? Social media for me has just always been a way that I, you know, since high school or, you know, early Facebook days has always been a way that I communicate with my friends. And, um, now it just feels like I have a lot more uh, friends. (laughs) Now I just have a lot more friends. And so it's, it does just come natural. It doesn't stress me out. I don't, I don't panic about a post or what the comment is going to be like. It's not an all consuming thing in my life at all. And I think there's some people that it, it feels again, like you're just showing your friends who you are. And it, and it, if you look at my, I deleted my personal Facebook page because I got too many friends on it. And so now I just have a Facebook fan page, but if if I were to resurrect my personal Facebook page from the mid two thousands, it would be a very similar mix of content and dialogue and engagement that I have now. And Mm -hmm. so, um, just on a much smaller scale. So Mm -hmm. I, I think it's important to just not for me, everyone's different, but for me, I don't like having these walls up with with fans, with my competitors, with whoever, I am a pretty open book and really like engaging with people and getting to know people. And so for me, it's, it's just kind of a natural part of my life. That's again, has been there since before running was what people followed me for what, you know, back in high school is again, how I communicated with my friends. I just have more friends now. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, just a hun- a few hundred thousand more friends than before. Um, <laughs> and I think that's good to mention. That's exactly the same approach that I take towards my social media. But, um, you know, I know obviously um, it's going to take a lot more uh, strength to not mention that as someone at your level. But, um, you know, with that, um, when you're when you're posting things, when you're sharing things, how do you what you just said, how do you not let those expectations of, oh, I have to kind of show my fans, you know, how, how great things are, or how cool this is or whatever. Like, you know, I feel like a lot of elite runners feel that pressure to kind of show, especially to maybe other competitors show that like, you know, this things are going great for me. This is good. How do you not let that expectation kind of get to you? I mean, I've had times that I am not posting about a treatment that I am getting. Like I, I had a really hurt Achilles for over a year, um, leading into the Olympics. And I didn't post about me getting shockwave therapy treatment on it. You know, mm-hmm. there are things that you, that every athlete's different. And for me, that was, that was something that I did want to keep 
private. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but other than that, other than keeping certain injury maintenance things private, there's really, for me, uh, nothing to, you know, there's nothing to hide. This Mm -hmm. is my life. And, and every one of my competitors is training hard. Every one of my competitors is having injuries there. There's good days and bad days. And so I do think that it's me sharing photos of me running or cross training or whatever, isn't, you know, changing how my competitors choose to compete against me. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, Mm -hmm. there's very little that you can learn through social media about Mm -hmm. the best tactics for racing your competitor. And so from that perspective, I feel like I never have to stress or feel anxious about what I'm posting, but from a just fan perspective, I think like this is my life and people choose to follow me because they are curious what yeah. I'm doing. And it, and it doesn't feel, it might just be something that's natural with me to not feel overwhelmed by it. Mm-hmm. But again, it's like, I just, before I had any fans or followers and I was just using social media to communicate with friends and post about my life in high school, it's kind of just yes, continued on from that. And, um, and it also is a valuable tool. I think there's been so many instances that I post something about, you know, running in a different place and someone recommends a place I should go to eat yeah. or to run, or you just realize how broad the net is of running and yeah. how worldwide people care about running and everyone, whether it's a fan directly responding, I can use social media to, to reach out to other people you know, people all over the world involved with running. And so I, I find it very valuable. And, um, from that perspective too, and it just creates such a a big community and nothing about it bothers me or stresses me out or affects me at all. (laughs) That's That's how it should be. And then related to that. So you, you know, you have shown maybe a little bit of a rebellious side. Sometimes we see little glimmers of it with, um, you know, you want, especially the one that comes to mind for me is, um, showing your support to your sponsor, New Balance. Um, now during the rule 40 blackout, um, I was curious whether the creative way people said you found to show your New Balance shoes, draping them around your neck after your race, um, was that intentional or was that kind of something that you just did without even thinking about it? And it just happened to kind of get the media's attention. The putting my shoes over my shoulder to show new balance is very much intentional, whether people, you know, there was no intention for the media to care a lot about it. That that's never the point Mm -hmm. of us doing anything is never to get attention. We're just trying to be true to ourselves and, um, do what feels right. Mm -hmm. And if the media cares, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think, you know, I, I wanted to respect the rules, which say that you can't cover the sponsor of the team, but I also wanted to showcase the other, the huge sponsor that has been with me for five years that, um, played, you know, the biggest role in my, in my success by providing me the financial support and stability that I need to train. And so it, to me feels like, of course I would. I would take my shoes off and, and have that brand in the forefront. And again, I'm, I didn't break any rules. (laughs) I didn't, I didn't cover the Nike logo and I want to respect the rules. And I also want to respect the relationship that USATF has. I mean, I'm, I get funds from USATF and I see that, you know, the, the group of USATF staff and employees that I work with, um, and medical, they're great. And, I don't want to, you know, piss anyone off, but I, I feel really strongly that I, I want to show my sponsor. And I also think it's weird that we can't, Mm -hmm. we can't just say thank you. And so right before rule 40 started, I on social media posted a big thank you the day before with a big new balance logo, because it's true. They're, they're the reason I'm successful or they're a big reason why I'm successful and they're wonderful people. And it only feels right to give them credit Absolutely, when I can. Yeah, no, and I'm glad you did. And, and it was, you know, very well received and very tasteful. And, um, and I'm glad that so many athletes kind of 
did the sim- similar thing of supporting their sponsors in that last moments that, that you were allowed. Um, now, before we kind of wrap up this interview here, uh, what's next for you? You know, I'm, I'm assuming you took some time off after the World Championship. Uh, you got married, so congratulations on that. Um, tell us about, like, you know, what what's happened for you since um, the World Championship? Since World Champs, I raced a few more times, and then Joe and I built from the ground up a 5K road race in my hometown, and the proceeds went to benefit a local cancer support group, mm. and we raised $19,000 for the charity. Amazing. We had we limited the field of participants to 500 people and we sold out. Um, so next year we're hoping to, you know, grow it bigger, but we had people from all over the country come and compete. We had an elite field with good prize money. Um, Paul Chalima won and, uh, and we had, uh, it was just a wonderful experience. We really wanted to provide, provide, create an event in the town that really gave back to the town in terms of, um, you know, people coming to eat at restaurants and rent hotel rooms and all of that, and also give back to this charity. And then the third prong for me, that was just as important as creating a good elite field and giving back to the elite community. So that race took a lot of effort and there was, was a team the of three of us that for anyone who's the elk run 5k emma coburn's elk run 5k okay. i'll put a link the in the ma- show notes <laughs> <laughs> the main street in crested butte is called elk avenue and the race starts and ends on elk avenue so that's that's where the name came from but it was a great time and it's going to be an annual event and we're just now you know setting the date for next year and and all of that so um and then after that we got married two weeks after that we got married so i had fifth avenue <laughs> and then two weeks later the elk run 5k and then two weeks later our wedding in Hawaii so it was wonderful and we had such a great time and then it's back to work (laughs) back to training yep (laughs) well then let's maybe just talk about that just one more thing before we get onto the running for real for for listeners who aren't sure you know what it's like to be a a professional or an elite runner um you know you're so committed year round you get maybe one or two weeks so how did it feel to having known you did this huge accomplishment, um, you know, had this race that was very successful and then you could step away and actually just be in the moment, not thinking about your running as a priority. How did that feel kind of allowing yourself to soak in that whole marriage experience? Yeah, it was, yeah, we do train so hard and to just have a few weeks where, you know, we, we got to Hawaii and spent the whole week there just with our friends and family vacationing and drinking and eating a lot and playing mm-hmm. beach football and having a lot of fun. So it was just wonderful to detach a little bit from being a pro athlete and just enjoy, enjoy the beach and enjoy not being on the set strict schedule that runners have to be on. And, yeah. um, so that was wonderful. Joe and I have been together since high school, nine and a half years now. So us getting married just felt like like, and of, of course that's going to happen eventually. Um, Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. and so the, the wedding was beautiful and we both cried and it was great. But I think what was more fun is just having our favorite people in the whole world celebrate with us, kind of celebrate 10 years of being together and celebrate day one of, of being married. So it was, it was really fun. Yeah, I definitely understand that having had my wedding in the US and I had, you know, having my two worlds combine like my English side and then my American come together and seeing them all in one place. So I definitely get what you're saying there. And it is just amazing having everyone you love together for the first time. Now, we're just going to take a moment to thank the sponsors and then we'll be back with the Running For Real 4. At this time of year, we are thankful for what we have, and I am especially thankful for this community. The Running For Real community is absolutely lovely, and as a podcast listener, you are one of my favourites, as this is a part of my business I put more effort into than anything else. This is also the time of giving, and our friends at Body Health are just as thankful for you guys as I am, but they're stepping it up a notch. Body Health is giving away a pack of six Perfect Amino tablets and a pack of six Perfect Amino XP tubs to two lucky listeners in the month of December. To enter, all you need to do is visit tinamuir.com forward slash Christmas giveaway and enter your email address. I'll announce the winners in January and get the products right to you. 
You can also use coupon code TINA10 for 10% off at bodyhealth.com if you don't want to wait. Now, for those of you who are first time listeners, body health was one of my secrets to success as a 236 marathoner, as it helped me recover so much faster in heavy training. And as for injuries, it sped up healing for those a lot faster too. Enter to win at tinamuir.com forward slash Christmas giveaway before December 31st. You heard Emma and I talking about brands, how important it is to find companies who support and believe in you. Well, one of those brands for me has always been Generation You Can, and they'll support you too. Generation You Can powders and bars provide sustained energy release, none of those sugar crashes that other products may give you, especially in marathons, you know, the last place we would ever want to run out of energy. But even though Generation You Can products are great, and I still use them every day, even now, by having a bar every morning, the reason I love You Can the most is because they care. They genuinely care about us as runners. That can be hard to find nowadays. And they come from humble beginnings as their product was developed to help a boy who had a life-threatening condition. They saved him and they can save you too, especially from the dreaded bonk and those stomach issues we get while running. You know, those are absolutely miserable and no one wants to deal with them. You can get 15% off at generationyoucan.com using code Running for Real. All right, Emma, just four more quick questions for you, starting with... Uh, a unique nutrition tip or just something that you do before a race that people maybe don't know? What do you eat before a race? Before a race, I've been eating the same thing since high school before races. Three hours before mm-hmm. the gun goes off, I have a bagel with peanut butter and banana. And I found that I can find that everywhere in the world that I'm racing. So it's, it's, uh, <laughs> that's my go-to. Yeah, actually that was my go-to until uh, I started marathoning. That was Exactly the same thing. And it, exactly the same reason. You can always find those things anywhere. All right. What about a running for real moment for you? A, run, a moment that only runners will understand? That's, I feel like every day is sometimes like, oh, this is <laughs> only runners will get this. But there's just been, you know, I think every runner on Christmas morning when they have to wake up and go do a workout. I I think it's funny because on social media, you'll see every single runner posting, like, even though it's Christmas, I'm doing this. And, (laughs) but when you're that athlete doing it, you feel like, why is this my job? Why is this my life? It's so hard. (laughs) And then of course, when it's over, you're so, you know, happy and you feel really good about yourself. But I think that's always like a, a real moment for runners is when on a holiday, New Year's day, Christmas day, Thanksgiving, you know, all these all these 4th of July, like all these special holidays that all your friends and family are just eating and drinking and being kind of lazy and having fun. You have to Uh buckle up and and do your job. Yeah. Yeah. But those are the moments that make a difference, uh, getting it in on those days for sure. All right. What about a high moment for you? Well, you don't have to share this with us if you want to say you've already, you've already shared enough about that one. Um, I think both Rio and London were tied as the highs because Rio was my first medal and the Olympics is such a universal moment that people always understand. And, um, but to be a world champion is also very special. So, I mean, they're, (laughs) they're pretty much tied as my two, you know, happiest moments in running. Okay. Thank you. And finally, what do you tell yourself when you're standing on the start line? It really depends on the race, but I'm often reminding myself of the game plan, you know, in, in London, it's go with it for 2k and in Rio, it was, you know, like stay relaxed and run 72s or whatever it was. Like I'm, I'm usually thinking of the, um, tactics that I'm about to, (laughs) to do. And, um, Mm -hmm. and then when the gun goes off, I say, okay, it's going to be over in nine minutes, make it count. (laughs) (laughs) That's definitely true. And make it count. You did, especially in those races. Okay. Um, one more thing. I usually ask my guests to send me a photo of them in a power pose, like how you would stand on the start of a race. I am sure you have plenty of those. In fact, I think I've seen some of yours. Um, will you send us a photo of your yourself in your power pose, uh, for the listeners? Sure. I'll try and find one. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay. Well, Emma, thank you so much. This was absolutely wonderful to learn from you and just hear your experience from you. Um, I know everyone has really enjoyed this and I just appreciate your time so much, especially when you're not feeling the best, um, with being sick right now. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thank you. See ya.
You can totally see how she's made it to where she has. She's just a humble, hardworking girl who loves to be a part of the team. So I want to thank Emma for talking to us on this day, despite not feeling very good. And uh, hopefully you kind of could tell that she wasn't feeling too well and give her some patience with any moments where she did have to cough. (laughs) You can find everything we talked about today at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 38. And next week we are going to have a special feel good episode and I have a challenge addict. I don't know if that's actually such a thing, but I'm going to make it one on the podcast to talk about his journey and next year he's planning on running a marathon in every country in the world and you're going to learn a lot about motivation and how to challenge yourself so if that's something you struggle with that's really going to be a good one for you to check out so I hope you have a great week you get lots of shopping done and remember if you missed last week's episode I gave you 25 running gift ideas so make sure you go listen to that one and then maybe you can get some good ideas all right have a great week Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.